Grace, peace, and joy are yours from God our Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our sermon text for this morning is the gospel reading for today from Matthew 14. I'll be reading portions of it again throughout the sermon. So for now, we bow our heads for a word of prayer. Oh Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts as well as our minds this morning, that we not only understand this word more fully, but we apply it to ourselves more faithfully. May we learn anew that blessed truth that you are indeed the friend of sinners, the one who is always there for us, who is carrying all our loads, and who is filling all our needs. Grant us this assurance for your love's sake. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our gracious Savior, dear fellow redeemed. Mrs. Scriven was going through a difficult time in life, a very difficult time. The economy in her native Ireland had really gone entirely downhill because there was the famous potato famine in Ireland in the middle 19th century. Thousands of people were out of work trying to find food whichever way they can. Many people, like Mrs. Scriven, would sneak into the potato fields at night, dig up the rotting potatoes with their bare hands, and then eat what they could before, before someone caught them in the field. It was a difficult life indeed. And for Mrs. Scriven, it was made even more difficult by the fact that death had thrust its cruel, unfeeling hand into her life and had taken away her husband. So now she was all by herself. What is more, she suffered severe illnesses, one after another, and her life seemed to be entirely hopeless, and she didn't know where to turn for help. In the midst of those dark and difficult days, Mrs. Scriven's son, Joseph, spoke to her about the source of hope. He did it by writing for her the hymn we just sang a few moments ago, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. He wanted his mother to know that no matter how dark the days, there was the light of God's love in his son Jesus shining into her heart and life. He wanted her to be sure that even though she felt so helpless, there was this one who would pick her up and carry her through life in his loving arms. The Jesus that Joseph Scriven talks about in his hymn is not the figment of his imagination. This is not an artificial Jesus, someone he's just made up. This is the Jesus that we see on page after page of Scripture, including in the text that we have before us this morning. And today, as we look at this well-known text, we want to consider this simple thought, what a friend we have in Jesus. We can be certain of this, first of all, because of his continual compassion. Secondly, we can be certain of this because of his impressive power. And finally, we can be certain of this because of his bountiful blessings. You know the story in our text, the feeding of the 5,000 very well, don't you? What's the most impressive part of this particular story? What thought really imprints itself on your heart and mind? when you hear the story again? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? Our Lord feeds 5,000 people, actually more than 5,000 people, and all he has are five small loaves, maybe like a muffin or a roll, and two small fish. Imagine that, feeding so many on so few. That certainly has to be the most impressive part here. Or does it? There's something else that's impressive here. 
See if you catch it as we read the opening verses of our text again. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitude heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Did you catch the impressive part of this story in the verse we just read? You may have missed it because Matthew begins in sort of a by-the-way sort of manner. He has just talked about Herod Antipas killing John the Baptist. You'll recall that John the Baptist had criticized Herod Antipas when Herod stole the wife of his brother Philip, Herodias. And then there was that famous dance of Salome. And finally, Herod beheaded John the Baptist. When this took place, Jesus went away from the cities to a deserted place by himself, Matthew says. He knew very well that Herod might turn his attention to him next. And our Lord knew that his time had not yet come. In addition, he needed to recharge himself spiritually, as it were. He had been ministering almost endlessly, preaching and healing people, and he just simply needed to get away. He probably went to a deserted area to the east of the Sea of Galilee. But when the people heard that he was there, we're told that a great crowd went out. In fact, Matthew here calls it a multitude of people. And that's where the amazing part of this story takes place. The evangelist tells us, when Jesus saw those people, how does it go on? He had compassion on them. Isn't that amazing? If we had been our Lord, we might have said, can't you give me a break? Can't I have a little time for myself? Or maybe we would have been a little more harsh. You people are only interested in outward things. You don't really want to follow my teachings. You only want to see what I can do for you in a physical way. But our Savior says none of those things. Instead, Matthew says he has compassion on them. How remarkable that is indeed, that our Lord's heart goes out to them. If you want to see how remarkable, just imagine for a moment that you're our Lord, and you're looking down on the world, and you're seeing people such as we who are here in church this morning. What do you say about those people? Don't you think? These people have come to me again for my love and forgiveness. After all the times that I have forgiven them, and then they've gone right back into those sins again. These people want me to show them mercy, even though I've been so merciful every day, and they haven't always responded to it. We would think that we've used up God's mercy but we're told that as the Lord looks on us, he looks the same way he does here with the people in our text. He has compassion on us. And what a comforting word that is for each of us. Our Lord has this continual care. The word in the original really means his heart goes out to us. But not only does his heart go out to us, he wants to do something for us in our need. Look at the people here in our text. Matthew says this large multitude comes and he heals their sick. We come to the Lord today and he assures us our sins are all forgiven. In fact, he's going to seal that forgiveness to us here at the table this morning. He wants us to know that not only does he feel for us, but he reaches out to us and gives us what we need most, the assurance of forgiveness and salvation. And that's true of every need in our lives. Remember what he told us in a sermon we heard about a month ago. He said, come unto me, all you who, are la who labor and are heavy laden. We might be weighed down, 
by the cares and concerns of this world, by the difficulties and distresses that we face in the workforce, or whatever the situation might be. And he says, I will take your burden from you and put my yoke, my yoke of guiding love on you, and you will have peace for your souls. That's the Savior we have, this friend in Jesus who is there in every kind of need. No wonder Joseph Scriven told his mother, what a friend we have in Jesus. And that's what we're reminding one another again this morning. We have a friend in Jesus and a friend who shows his power in a most remarkable way. Our text here continues. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. What a remarkable contrast we have in this part of our text. A contrast between the disciples and our Lord Jesus. Look at the disciples, first of all. As the day goes on, it's getting late. The disciples come to Jesus and say, send these people away. Understand, the disciples are not being unkind or uncaring. Just the opposite is the case. It is late in the day, and they know the people haven't had anything to eat. So they say, let them go back to the villages around here while there still is time that they can buy themselves something to eat. In other words, they want their needs to be taken care of. But at the same time, they don't know how to fill those needs because Jesus says to them rather casually, you give them something to eat. And how that saying must have struck them when our Lord gave them that directive. Us? Give them something to eat? We only have here a little sack lunch. All we have are five loaves and two small fish. How can that go around these tens of thousands of people? But then what happens here in our text? Jesus then says, Bring them, the fish and loaves, here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. Can you hear the words of our text here and not be amazed at what our Lord does? In front of our Savior are thousands of people, well over 5,000 people, by the way, even though we call this the feeding of the 5,000. It probably should be called the feeding of the 15 or 20,000. So there are thousands of people in front of Jesus, thousands of hungry people. In his hand are five loaves and two fish. And yet he blesses them and starts to distribute them, and there's enough for everyone there to receive food. How remarkable indeed the power of this friend of sinners, the one who is there in every time of need. Have you ever seen this happen in your life? That our Lord has used his impressive power in this way of filling a need? You may think, no, I really haven't. In fact, if somebody claimed to have received that kind of miracle, we'd probably be a little skeptical, wouldn't we? And yet, if we look at events with the eyes of faith, we can see that our compassionate Savior is using his impressive power to fill our needs. I recall a time when I was vicaring in Tucson, Arizona for Grace Church. One day a man came to my door and he asked for some money. He said that he didn't have any food for his children and he couldn't afford gas for his car to get to work and he certainly needed to get to work so he wouldn't lose his job. It just so happened I had just counted my earthly wealth and quite frankly all I had was ten dollars and thirty-three cents to last me another eleven days. And now this man wants my money? 
Swallowing hard, I reached into my wallet and I gave him the $10. Now I had 33 cents for 11 days. But something remarkable happened. As that man who asked for money was going away, a man from the congregation came up and he said, here, here's a little something for you that I wanted to show my appreciation for you going to visit my mother. Six or seven months earlier, I had visited his mother in the hospital a number of times, and he was going to show his appreciation with a little something. Later on, I opened up the envelope, and the little something turned out to be $100, which was king's ransom in those days for a vicar. But I didn't get to open it up right away because the telephone was ringing. And there were calls from people who wanted me to come over for lunch or for dinner in the next week and a half. In fact, one call came from a man who owned a gas station. And he said, Vicar, I'd like to provide all your gas for the next month. Just a coincidence, right? Or this compassionate Savior using his impressive power to fill needs in our lives. And as I say, that's just a small instance. If we would look into our lives again and again, we'd see the Savior at work doing the most remarkable things. He here fills th thousands of people with food that satisfies. And doesn't he do the same thing in our lives? He gives us that which satisfies and he fills all our needs. In fact, this friend of sinners does that in a remarkable way because we're told here, so they all ate and were filled. They took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Suppose you were part of the cleanup crew here after this miracle of the feeding of the thousands. What would you have said wouldn't you be inclined to say in surprise, well, there's more food left over than Jesus had to begin with. He only had five loaves and two little fish. And now we have ten baskets full of food. We can send home a snack lunch with it for everyone here. How remarkable indeed that our Lord shows that kind of bounty as well. Don't we see that in our own lives? Not long ago, I found one of those little fillers in the newspaper. These are those little things they insert when an article doesn't fill up an entire column. So they put something at the bottom of that column to, end, to fill out the space. And this particular filler said, we in America waste every week what would feed a family of five for a month in some parts of the world. Think of that. Think of how we have been blessed outwardly just in something such as food. We waste, not just have left over, but we waste enough in a week to fill a family of five in some parts of the world. And I have been in some of those parts of the world as well, in India, in Ukraine. Doesn't that show that we have the leftovers of God's bounty in our lives? Not that's just the leftovers of having a few sparse things, but the leftover of God's bounty that overflows our life again and again. Our God has shown his goodness to us in so many ways that we now have more than we can ask or imagine, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians. When we hear what our Savior does in our text and in our lives, don't we have to say, what a friend we have in Jesus, who not only forgives all our sins, but fills our every need as we go through life. May God grant that we always praise our Savior for his continual compassion, his impressive power, and his bountiful goodness. May we, in short, say, what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen.